First of all, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Juan Hidalgo. I'm the Monterey County Agricultural Commissioner. Uh, and join, joining me this morning today is a panel of um, agricultural leaders in our industry. Uh, we have Chris Valadez, he's president of the Grower Shipper Association of the Central Coast. Uh, we have Jeff Cardinali, who is the director of communications for the California Strawberry Commission. We have Kim Stemler, executive director for the Monterey County Vintners and Growers Association, and Norm Groot, executive director for the Monterey County Farm Bureau. So thank you for being here today. Uh, today is a, it's a big deal for our county because we are releasing our annual crop report uh, where we talk about uh, you know how our growers did last year, the value of our commodities. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to always have the opportunity to talk about, uh, uh, about our county and some of the great commodities that we grow here. And I'm gonna have a little short PowerPoint presentation that gives just a brief overview of the, of the crop report this year. So as is tradition in Monterey County, every crop report has a theme, and the theme for this year is rooted in serving our community. And the report highlights um, some of the work that the Agricultural Commissioner's Office does and some of the programs to protect agriculture, to pr protect our communities, and to protect our environment. Um, agricultural commissioners go back more than 140 years. Uh, agricultural commissioners started as the Board of Horticultural Commissioners back in 1881. Uh, and at that time, there were 11 counties that initially had horticultural commissioners. Uh, some of the responsibilities back in those days included uh, plant quarantine regulation, addressing rodent, insect, and weed infestations, and vegetable quality and standards. Uh, in 1919, the state created the Department of Agriculture, known today as CDFA, or the Food and Ag Department, um, with the role to protect uh, a safe and healthy food supply. Uh, in 1929, county horticultural commissioners became agricultural commissioners. And then in 1988, um, Agricultural commissioners combined with weights and measures officials to also gain the title of sealer of weights and measures for the county. Um, so agricultural commissioners go uh, you know, a long ways back. Um, and in that time, uh, many of the programs that started 140 years ago continue to be um, put in place today to protect our communities and agriculture. You know, some of these programs include fruit and vegetable standardization, ensuring the quality of fruits, size uh, requirements, ensuring that packaging and labeling for containers uh, meets state requirements, uh, weights and measures, which is a primary uh, consumer protection program that keeps uh, both uh, consumers and businesses on the same uh, level playing field. Um, by ensuring that uh, commercial devices are accurate in the marketplace. This includes commercial scales, for example, when you go to the grocery store, or making sure that when you go to a gas station, you get the one gallon of gas that you pay for. Uh, our staff also does package inspections to ensure that the net quantity statements of those uh, packages is correct, and that they have correct labeling as required, required by the federal regulations. Uh, we have also pest exclusion, which is a main program to help to keep pests out of Monterey County. Our staff do uh, inspections of incoming plant shipments to make sure that uh, plants and vegetables and fruits coming from other areas of the state um, are not bringing in pests that we don't have here in our, in our county. Uh, pesticide use enforcement is a key program to ensure that uh, growers are following laws and regulations, making sure that uh, they're using pesticides safely and effectively, training their uh, pesticide handlers, their field workers, and also making sure that those applications um, are being done correctly to ensure the safety of field workers as well as our communities. Um, and lastly, just another program that's a big program is pest detection and management. Um, getting ahead of any exotic pests that may have severe impacts here in our county, and not just for agriculture, but also for our home gardens and our environment. You know, some examples include fruit flies coming from other areas, um, primarily uh, Mexico. Um, 
and uh, Hawaii in some instances, uh, Japanese beetle, which is a pest that is uh, found in the East Coast in some states that can have some serious detrimental impacts in our area, and um, spongy moth, which is another pest that we don't have here in California that it, um, some states in the East Coast have it, and so we want to make sure we don't get it here because it can have some disastrous consequences, uh, especially in our uh, environment and landscape. Um, so getting ahead of uh, detecting this pest uh, plays a significant role in our ability to be able to eradicate um, much easier than um, having something become get out of hand because then it becomes more complicated, can result in millions of dollars in losses to our growers, but it can also increase some of the uh, quarantine regulations in place, making it a lot more difficult for our growers to be able to export commodities out of our county. So these are just a few of the programs that the Agricultural Commissioner's Office oversees on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, many of these things here started uh, 100 year, 140 years ago. Now, just to give you an oversight, um, as many of you are aware, California is the number one agricultural state. Uh, According to USDA, uh, the gross value of agricultural commodities in our state is estimated at 51.2 billion in receipts. That's uh, gross value of commodities in the state. Uh, the next state uh, close to California is Iowa at 34.9 billion. So you can see what the difference is there. So California is a very important uh, agricultural state for our nation. Um, our agriculture is absolutely diverse. We grow over 400 commodities here in California. And, you know, some of the figures are quite significant. You know, our state grows a third of our nation's vegetables and three quarters of the fruits and nuts, just to give you a sense of how important California is, uh, not just for our own um, residents here, but also to the rest of the nation. Um, and then just to give you uh, an oversight of Monterey County. So according to USDA, the latest census of agriculture, uh, we have over 1,100 farms in Monterey County. That's 1.3 uh, million acres of farmland, 361,000 acres of cropland, 830,000 acres of um, pasture land, and 294,000 irrigated acres. So just to give you the scope of how uh, important agriculture is in our county and to give you an idea of some of the key areas where production takes place. Of course, we have the Salinas Valley, we have the Pajaro Valley, uh, we have the coastal areas of Moss Landing and Marina, and then we have production along the Carmel Valley as well. So our county has, it's very diverse in the commodities that we, that we grow, uh, and certainly there's agricultural production in different areas of our county. And then the, the reason why we're here today is to look at what the value of our agricultural production gross value wise was for 2022. Um, so there was a 13% increase compared to 2021. So we're looking at a $4.6 billion agricultural industry for Monterey County. Um, it's great to see uh, such an increase as we continue to uh, become more normalized coming out of the pandemic. Um, it's great to see that there's a lot of high consumer demand for the high value crops that we grow here in Monterey County. And then to look at the top commodities uh, for 2022, uh, we have strawberries at the top of the list at $958 million, leaf lettuces at $842 million, Head lettuce at 546 million, broccoli at 519 million, and cauliflower at 216 million. So those are the top five. Um, you know, vegetable production here in our county makes up about close to 70% of the entire gross agricultural production value for our, uh, our county here. Uh, fruits and vegetables make, or fruits and uh, nuts make up about 25%. Um, on the tap thumb commodities, we have celery, wine grapes, spinach, nursery, and Brussels sprouts, which continue to be, um, there's high demand for those commodities grown in our county. So it's great to see, um, you know, how well our growers have done uh, in some of these main commodities uh, here in 2022. 
Um, as always, every year for our growers brings challenges and there's trends as well. Um, you know, there are many things that can impact um, pricing for agricultural commodities, as well as uh, some of the production yields. Uh, and I wanted to highlight, a, 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 you know, three different commodities here. Uh, you know, one great production, if you look at the report, we saw a decrease in value of about 20% compared to 2021. Uh, there was a drop from, uh, we went to 173 million for 2022, a drop from 218 million compared to 2021. You know, a lot of that had to do with some of the weather impacts that we experienced last year. Uh, if you remember in mid to late summer, we got um, some warmer than usual weather and that certainly began to have some impact in some of the yields uh, for our wine growers. Um, for lettuce production, impatience necrotic spot virus, INSV continues uh, to be a serious pro problem for our growers. Um, that continues to impact production yields. This has been a problem that has been ongoing for the last three years. Um, our growers working with uh, the UC Extension, USDA, and our local industries are trying to work closely to put some tools in place that can help to mitigate uh, some of the damage for INSV. At this point, there's no cure for that disease. But that being said, even though we saw some lower returns on yields, you know, lettuces continue to demand, um, uh, you know, a high interest from consumers. Uh, and market pricing was up compared to the previous year. There was a 13% increase for leaf lettuce uh, to 842 million, and there was a 21% increase for head lettuce to 546 million. Um, and then the other commodity that was uh, seriously impacted in 2022, and I think we have all heard about this uh, for several months now, uh, cannabis and the impact uh, to the industry. Uh, a lot of California operations have had to close their doors in the last year uh, due to the um, lower pricing of, for cannabis. Um, certainly, and unfortunately, you know, our producers here in uh, Monterey County are not exempted from that decrease in lower prices. And so we saw a decline of 54% in 2022, down to 283 million. Uh, compared to 618 million in uh, 2021. So these are, you know, some of the um, trends and some of the challenges that we saw in, in 2022 for some of our main commodities here in Monterey County. Um, organic production plays a very important role here in Monterey County. Um, we have over 81,000 acres that are uh, registered as organic, and overall our agricultural gross value uh, for organic production is over a billion dollars in the county. And, you know, just painting a highlight of, um, you know, the value for our various commodities, uh, last year we had over 370 uh, million pounds in commodities exported out of Monterey County to 35 different countries uh, in the world. So, I mean, that uh, really speaks volumes to, uh, you know, how important uh, our production is here in Monterey County. Um, and lastly, the last thing I wanted to uh, uh, say is I just wanted to thank our farmers, ranchers, sports commissions, and agricultural associations, uh, and certainly our uh, guests here today uh, for their tremendous collaborations in helping us to compile the annual crop report. It takes a team to be able to uh, get the data, put it together, um, and it, it's, a, uh, it's an effort that um, definitely we couldn't have done without the help of our growers and our industry leaders here in Monterey County. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to my staff for their tremendous work and dedication in compiling the report this year. Uh, Graham, uh, Shayla, Ronnie, Bruce, and Rich, uh, thank you so much. I know it takes a lot of effort, and this year uh, there was additional uh, work on your plate because on top of trying to work and put the crop report together, we also had to deal with some of the damage from the flooding that took place uh, this winter. Um, and that being said, um, that concludes my presentation. And now I'd like to um, 
have give our guests an opportunity to make a couple of comments and I'm gonna start with uh, Norm. I know he's got another commitment so his time is a little short today but Norm, thanks for being here. All right, thank you Juan, appreciate it. And as you heard, there is good news, 13.1% uh, overall increase over 2021. So nice to see an increase and, and possibly a recovery of what we experienced during the pandemic. And particularly of note, vegetable crops grew by 21.8%, showing that the markets are, are coming back, both in pricing and in distribution. But of course, that comes with challenges. Uh, the costs of input also increased dramatically. We all remember the inflationary period that we went through this past year. And that means that labor, fertilizer, other crop inputs dramatically increased due to that inflationary period. So farmers are still continuing to face challenges to make the bottom line work. That increase that you see is in the gross revenue of what was received for our crops. It does not reflect the profits or the bottom line of those farming operations. And there's some challenges there. Pests and diseases are a continuous concern, particularly in the leafy green and strawberry crops. INSV continues to impact leafy green production here locally, causing entire fields to be lost. Much more research is needed to understand and battle back this disease. Also, I, I urge you all to check out the pest exclusion section in the crop report itself. This touches on just a few of the pests and diseases that our farmers and ranchers have to deal with on a daily basis here in Monterey County. Highlighting this is the crop diversity that continues to drive our local ag economy. And many of the major crops, even though they're showing uh, decline in acreage over the last decade or so, they're still showing larger increases in the value of those crops. It is this diversity that allows our farmers to adjust their production schedules to meet the market demands and the shifting consumer preferences by growing crops in multiple rotations. With the improved water supply this year, the prospects for groundwater sustainability are achievable while the growing of uh, multiple crops will continue here in Monterey County. We're getting there. We're extremely fortunate to have a developed water supply system that captures water for storage and provides recharge during our irrigation seasons. And again, ag tech is changing the way we farm, increasing yields while creating efficiencies and balancing the resources and the environment. And really, we're moving now into a stage of regenerative farming practices here. The recent Biological Summit and the Organic Producer Summit highlight local production practices that are now including these regenerative practices as well as cover crops. So Monterey County is very much the definition of intense agriculture with our working environment that produces a significant portion of our nation's daily fresh food products. I wanna thank the Ag Commissioner and his staff for their resources committing to the local farming and ranching community here and ensuring that we have a compliant working environment here in Monterey County. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Norm. And I'd like to uh, see if Kim wants to say a couple of words. Sure, I, I'm starting with a thanks to you, Juan, <laughs> and to your wonderful staff um, for being great partners uh, because we do work together regularly and we very much appreciate you and your partnership. So, um, I have to explain why wine grapes had a 20% reduction in value, which is not easy. And I want you to know that although I'm explaining a reduction, I think this is short term. I do not think that's our long term perspective. So let's go over the short term pain um, and that our acreage continues to reduce, uh, to be decreased. We used to be consistently around 44 to 46,000 acres. That's the same size as Napa. Uh, for well over a decade. Between 21 and 22, there was a 1.7% reduction in our acreage. The average price, though, per ton actually increased. So let's talk about this. What is the main story? And the story is a bigger wine story. It's about recalibration. Recalibration post-COVID, post-2020 fires, 
figuring out how um, our, throughout the state, how our vineyards deal with the changing climate patterns that are happening and what we do about that. So in terms of reduction of acres, why are we losing acres? Several things. We've got aging vines. They're 20 to 30 years old. They're less productive. They're going to need to be pulled pretty soon. But we don't know where the market is going right now. So growers are just holding back. They're not pulling those vines. And the ones that they're, they pull, they're not replanting right now. So that's why we're seeing that reduction. That's also one of the reasons we see a decrease in productivity. And then, it's, I'm sorry I keep on doing this. I can't see you and this at the same time. So, <laughs> so we also, in addition to that heat spike that we had, and it's getting warmer in August, although we probably don't believe that it will get warmer right now, it will get warmer in August, and Labor Day might also be awful. And, and our grapes don't quite know how to handle that. They're used to moderate weather. So we need to figure out how to help our grapes actually moderate these spikes in temperatures. Then the other thing is um, we actually had a frost late spring and we lost a little bit. Other areas of the state lost much more and that was 2022, not this year. Uh, so throughout the state, value price wine grapes didn't do as well as premium wine grapes. We have both. We have a significant amount of acreage planted in value priced. So why is that? How much wine was everybody drinking during COVID? A lot, especially value-priced wine. You would sit at home and you would drink a lot. You weren't going out to eat. You weren't necessarily buying the premium wines. So throughout the state, there's been this reduction in value-priced wines. So, um, and because of inflation, consumers are a lot more price sensitive. Even though they're wanting value-priced wines, they're still watching. So with all of these uncertainties, there's not a lot of interest in value price wine grapes right now. There's just, it's all about market uncertainties. Um, and with the exception of one large vineyard that we lost a couple of years ago, I do not think, we do not think that those lost acreage will be replanted into any other long-term crops. We really think they'll eventually be replanted into vineyards. So what's promising? after that 20% reduction. Uh, what's promising is our weather. So it, right now, everyone is looking for moderate growing weather with water. We are an ideal area for anybody to grow in in the future. We can figure out how to deal with these little weather, weather spikes. We don't live in 115, 120 degree temperatures. We also tend not to have frost. So that moderate weather really is to our advantage. So I do see over the next 10 years, and, and others agree that the Central Coast is the growing region over the next 10 years. So I think this will be changed. Hopefully I'll have a different story to tell you next year. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. And I'd like to give Jeff an opportunity to talk a little bit on behalf of the Strawberry Commission. Good morning, everyone. First, I want to say thanks to Juan and his staff for, for inviting us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, so you saw the numbers that strawberries are nearly a billion dollar business in Monterey County. And, um, you know, for all the growers uh, and shippers and processors who work in Monterey County, first and foremost, you have to have um, a really good handle on all of the rules and regulations that growers have to face. And growers in California, and especially here in Monterey County, face some of the toughest regulations in the world. And I don't say that as a negative. I say that as something that, that growers just have to deal with. And having a strong relationship with the Ag Commissioner's Office uh, is essential because the Juan and his staff are the ones that know every rule inside and out and help each individual grower, where they, whether they're farming five acres or 500 acres, to really make sure that they're complying with the rules and regulations set forth by the state and by the federal government. And so that's very important. Um, for strawberry growers, it's all about being sustainable, um, wanting to make sure that they're, that they're growing a crop that's not only uh, stewards of the land, but stewards of the, of the communities in which they serve. As everyone knows, a lot of strawberry farms are grown near schools or grown near homes. And so it's very important that the strawberry farmers are very uh, cognizant of, of where they're farming and who they're farming for. Um, oftentimes, strawberry farmers' first customers are their own families. So it's very important to them that uh, the strawberries that are produced um, are healthy and are safe not only for obviously for their families, but for all who enjoy strawberries. Um, 
you know, right now is um, a little bit of a challenging time this year. I know we're talking about 2022, but obviously we, everyone knows what happened this year with the flooding and, um, and the rain events. And I think it's a testament to not only strawberry growers, but for all of the commodities that are represented in Monterey County, just how resilient um, farmers are. It's a tough business, but um, when you have allies like the Monterey County Agricultural uh, Commissioner and, and his staff, uh, you know that you always have a lifeline when you need it to help you get through the troubled times. And so we're very appreciative to Juan and his staff, and we're looking forward to, uh, to a good 2023 in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And last but not least, uh, Chris, if you'd like to make some comments. Uh, sure. Thank you, Juan. Um, pleased to be up here with, with our colleagues in agriculture that, that represent both agriculture in general and, and commodities specifically. I think this report, you know, if you contrast it with reports prior, and I would project reports into the future, it, it will corroborate that that farming's farming is like a roller coaster, and you know, I'm most familiar with the vegetable crop portfolio that Juan kind of um, identified as you know uh, uh, responsible for 70 percent of the overall farm gate crop value reflected in the the 2022 crop year crop report. Um, but, you know, it, it's also important to understand, you know, um, I think a little bit more deeply what factors affected value increase, particularly as it relates to um, the lettuces category. You know, if you're looking at crop year 2022 and entering into the lettuce production season, namely here in the Salinas Valley, you know, we were coming out of 21, which was an impactful year as it relates to lettuce damages from not only INSV, but really co-infection from both INSV and soil-borne diseases, a primary one named Pythium wilt, which is actually what is responsible for causing the lettuce to collapse and have that wilt effect. Pressure was, was significantly impactful in 2021. And so as you leave 2021, moving into 2022, kind of it's interesting kind of uh, infectious disease analogy or what we all experienced from COVID, you, you still had, and we believe we saw a level of disease that was, you know, uh, let's say moderate to strong that was still in circulation. So coming out of the winter into the spring, you had a higher rate or higher levels of disease and disease incidents that was circulating throughout the 2022 year. Well, what, what, intensified and, and negatively correlated to lettuce yields decreasing, but because there was a relatively robust demand, um, pricing increased in correspond to supply and demand. We saw the weather that Kim mentioned that negatively affected wine grapes also negatively affected lettuce crops, but why? It's not just because you have warm weather, but what significantly impacted the lettuce is you have warm weather that sustained over multiple days that just overstresses the lettuce's system to defend itself against symptom expression from INSV and Pythium wilt. So it's a symptom expression issue, which in some cases doesn't really affect, um, you know, the lettuce's ability to be kind of a um, healthful, nutritious product, it still would be, but it's not marketable. In some cases, you do have the wilting effect, which is the collapse, the browning, and it looks like it just flattened from a, a heat torch in the field. In other cases, you would have lettuce that, to you and I, it might look perfectly good and, and great. Like, why wouldn't we sell that, put it into the marketplace? Well, you can't because of defects in quality. You might see on the insides brown veining, brown spotting that then makes the buyer want to reject the load. It's not marketable, it's lettuce they do not want. So that also likewise, whether it's from wilt or whether it's just from a, a blemish or something more cosmetic, you can't put it in the marketplace. It's a complete loss. And so we are seeing and have continued to see, I think it's reflective in past crop reports and it will be reflective in future ones. You know, climate weather is significantly impactful. Again, it wasn't that because we had heat, but we had unseasonably warm heat sustained over a longer period of time that stressed out the lettuce crop over multiple days to the point where you couldn't irrigate the commodity enough to rehydrate it in a way where it would be resilient to stand up against the effects of heat. So it, it, its defenses were overtaxed. It was susceptible to disease. You had a higher level of disease at the beginning of the year that was sustained throughout the 2022 crop year, and you had more collapse, thus you had a bigger problem. But correspondingly, you thinned out some of the supply, demand was strong, 
prices corresponded, which is why we all saw and members of the media were largely responsible for communicating locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally, you know, these um, atypically high prices on a carton of lettuce or a, a per head of lettuce. It was, it was sky high last year. Well, this is all reflected in what was that jump that we're seeing in the 2022 numbers. It's directly connected. Um, going forward into 2023, I think it's important to note um, I, we can't pr I can't predict what we're going to see as a final number, but because of the work um, led by the Agricultural Commissioner's Office and its pest detection uh, and inspections department, um, they have been particularly effective kind of learning lessons from 2020, 2021, and 2022 as it relates to disease presence and prevalence and working to be more aggressive on weed abatement, both on farm collaboratively and off farm, non farm properties to ensure that weeds where those weeds are hosts for pests and where those pests are infected with the disease, that those are being knocked down as aggressively as is appropriate. So that as we start these seasons year after year, we're keeping that level of disease at the lowest levels possible to give ourselves a better chance that we're not going to have even when you do have warmer weather, the type of um, aggressive collapse that you would find because you've done a better job early and throughout the season controlling and suppressing that disease pressure and so we're we're more hopeful what 23 may portend but you know the story remains to be written but thank you to what the work you guys are doing the research leadership from uc and usda and the collaborative partnership with industry to really try to mitigate as best we can the effects of what has been a problematic disease uh, complex this past few years Great. thank you Chris. Okay. May I mention one more thing, and I don't think I mentioned it. One of another contributing factor to wine grape reduction in production is disease, and I didn't mention that. Uh, so there's a leaf roll virus that significantly reduces reduction uh, production. Unfortunately, it's caused by airborne critters, and we've got lots of wind in the Salinas Valley, so they just fly down the Salinas Valley and land on wine grapes. Um, some vineyards actually pull their uh, vineyards if they have this disease and trying to prevent it some don't unfortunately so that was also a contributing factor thanks great thanks so much um now i would like to open it up uh for any questions that you may have yes sir uh so i, I know norm touched on uh, inflation having an effect but can you expand more on how inflation affects the overall price that that increase in uh, Monterey County? Uh, the crop report says 13.1 percent this year. How much, if any, effect does inflation have on that number? Um, that's a great question. I'm sure it has a significant impact. You know, just uh, in our nation, we were seeing 9 percent inflation last year, um, and so. You know, I don't know if that number would equate directly to what we saw necessarily. Um, so I, I don't know to what extent, but I would say, you know, if we're seeing 9% inflation in the marketplace, everything else is being uh, impacted as well, in, including our growers and production. And like Norm said, you know, just the cost of uh, buying fertilizer and uh, inputs, uh, all of that was impacted as well. But uh, Norm, I don't know if you had any additional comments to that or Chris. I would just add, you know, we saw dramatic price increases in fertilizer last year. And, and at the point, I think there was even a 250% increase at one point. Um, that was not reflected in the price of the crops. The crops did not increase their value the same way. So that means the bottom line pressure becomes increasingly worse for farmers and ranchers when that happens. So I think. Overall, when you probably look at all the numbers, the inflation far outpaced the value of the crops and their increases that they saw in the market value. Do we usually see double digit increases from year to year? Uh, not usually. I would say, yeah, not usually. Uh, it depends. Uh, it's not entirely uncommon. And certainly, you know, there are many factors that can contribute to uh, double digit increases. Um, I think, you know, probably one of those things is this continuance to emerge out of the pandemic. I think 2022 was one of those years where people really began to do 
uh, get out more, uh, you know, started going to restaurants a lot more, and I think that has a significant impact in demand for some of our commodities. People are uh, potentially cooking less at home and going out some more, and that uh, helps to, uh, you know, uh, support some of the demand from restaurants for our commodities, which, you know, there was a, a, a decline during the pandemic where people were staying more at home, uh, and so, you know, uh, supply to restaurants was uh, impacted uh, because there wasn't that demand there. So I think, you know, seeing double digits is a combination of uh, several things, as it was mentioned here, uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic, plus, you know, unfortunately, some of the disease pressure and supply and demand, which created, uh, you know, some higher prices due to uh, high consumer demand for our commodities. Mm -hmm. And it, Kim will love this. I think it's directly tied to the <laughs> increase that we saw in 2022 in tourism, getting people out, getting them into restaurants, mm -hmm. getting them into different areas and traveling has a, a dramatic effect on how the marketing of our products that are grown here and the distribution of those. Um, I think the one area of the market that really hasn't come back is the office space. We're still seeing that people are working from home. And so you're not seeing that much of a recovery in the daily market um, as far as restaurants are concerned. But I think overall, restaurants have done a dramatic return to where they were almost at pre-pandemic levels. And then part of it is tourism. People are getting out and traveling. I have a question. Did the industry experience lack of farm workers and labor shortage 2022? What is Well, I think we've had labor shortages for a number of years uh, in our county. Um, I don't know if there was a, a, a particular shortage last year. I know that there's been more H2A workers uh, coming into our county to, to help our growers uh, to uh, produce our commodities. Um, but labor has been an issue for a long time. Uh, Chris, I don't know if... I mean, we've, we've had chronic shortages so i don't think 2022 was any different from what's been the case i think it's it's the pressures actually increased just because of the factors we've all discussed before whether it's a um, number of uh, lack of mobility amongst uh, farm workers who ultimately reside in let's say california or monterey county um, age so aging out of the workforce as a result you do have a shortage you have a shortage that's been sustained it's been growing at, at you know uh, relatively uh, definable rates that we've seen you've had h2a so the utilization of the h2a guest worker visa program that's increased you have monterey county as an example you know of all the h2a guest workers that come into california to be to perform agricultural work monterey county is home to over a quarter 25 percent so it's the single biggest region by far that utilizes a guest workforce primarily because we have a chronic shortage and it's not just an endemic or affecting this region but it's acutely impactful in this region for those reasons cost of housing housing limitations and so it's a i would presume it's a lot harder to be a california resident and plan upon you know um, earning a living for yourself and your family for six to eight months out of the year worth of work in monterey county compared to another region in california where housing might be more affordable and there might be more of it and so it puts a lot more pressure onto the system namely the employer to figure out you know how are they going to um, ensure that their workforce is as stabilized as is possible to keep up with what our market demands and business reality and so i wouldn't say we're at um yeah. Uh, there's any acute difference in 2022 but but the story is we've been in a situation of, of chronic shortage for a number of years but it has been acutely impactful to an area such as monterey county hi good morning i have a question um you all touched upon disease especially for the lettuce crops and weather could be like a contributing factor to inflation and all that um can you just elaborate a little bit on that and if that's something that's going to continue to be like an ongoing challenge and kind of moving on as the year progresses and stuff like that? Um, I'll take a stab. Um, <laughs> there's always been, been challenges. I think what, what's different, um, if you look at, for example, 2020, 
in through this report 2022 is for for lettuce it's been severely impacted by the co-infection and the symptom expression from both the pythium wilt and an impatient necrotic spot virus until to, to the extent you have that in circulation and disease intensity is high you will continue i imagine to see fluctuations with respect to how it affects your lettuce yields do we anticipate that that will worsen no we actually anticipate that that will um, that those conditions will be uh, alleviated if not more managed or mitigated why do we believe that well for one there are i think there's a lot more attentiveness there are uh, mechanisms in place largely through the Ag Commissioner's Office, but also in partnership with industry to be very aggressive on the abatement of weed and weed control. Seems very, you know, maybe mundane, but there are a, a set of weeds um, that are hosts to Western flower thrip and where Western flower thrip are infected and then move because of the wind and may jump over into neighboring or miles away uh, lettuce fields and nibble on lettuce. Now you have infected plants. Now there's disease. So we're not going to eliminate thrips per se, but what we can do is work on weed management to ensure that we're eliminating or reducing as much as possible hosts in that threat for potential infection and thus for kind of that transfer of the disease, which means you keep your pressure, your disease pressure down, kind of less disease is in circulation amongst the population. And so, you know, the healthy population has a better chance to, to strive, uh, uh, thrive later on. The other advancement that is accelerating now is really the, the availability of, you know, I have to be careful about terming it, but INSV may be um, uh, resistant or tolerant traits. So there are seed companies now that have put into market or are continuing to develop through genetics and breeding um, newer lettuce seed varieties that will display traits that will allow them to stand up to symptom expression. So even where it may be infected, it would not show symptoms, therefore it would not be a lettuce quality or safety issue, which would allow the farming operation and the shipper to put that product in the market. Therefore, you don't have a negative economic impact from the production of that, uh, that product. And there is more and more of that type of seed in those varieties that are coming into the marketplace this year. So for this crop season is really the, the first, you know, uh, year of any note of new varieties that hit the market. And so hopefully what we will see and what I think farms will plan for is in the later parts of, of the summer when we might normally expect warmer weather is when those varieties are actually going to be the varieties that are in production versus you know putting those varieties in production under a cooler period of time so that they can kind of uh, withstand and show that their resistance qualities could stand up to the effects of um, wilt or the heat which would overstress that plant and make it susceptible to disease and so we would anticipate from that disease complex we're, we're going to get better but you know, this is ag. I, I initiated my statements with it's a roller coaster. There, there's always something. It could be water. It could be a different disease complex. And so I think the industry is always on guard to figure out how to best mitigate the next challenge. Can I, if, I, if I may mention something, and I, I don't know that everyone realizes this. So, and I think this is also true for other commodities. But in wine grapes, we're connected to every other wine region in the world. So we're the U.S., universities in the U.S. are working with Australia and New Zealand and France researchers. So throughout the world, everyone is looking uh, at new rootstock and varietals that can, the things that Chris in some ways was talking about. Um, but I think it's very impressive. If you were to, to throw open the covers, you really see a coordinated world of researchers in ag working together and it's critical that the U.S. government, that California fund these research programs, and that we fund the, the industry funds them as well. So they're very important, and that's also really positive. I think one of the things that we're not mentioning here too is the cost of regulatory compliance in California. We are an extremely expensive state to do business in, as well as for agriculture, and the costs of workplace uh, rules and regulations water quality, air quality, uh, the cost to employers, particularly farm employers, is, is getting very expensive in California and will continue to do so as we institute more regulations. So 
uh, the pressure will be still on the bottom line to maintain that compliance and, and the affordability of that compliance. And I think just to kind of round up that question, I think from an invasive exotic pest standpoint, I think some of the warmer climate that we have experienced here in California definitely makes it more attractive for exotic pests to be able to survive in our state. Uh, exotic fruit flies are a pe perfect example of that. It used to be rare for us to have finds of those flies this far north in our state. Uh, you know, these are pests that were commonly found in LA, in the LA area, just because that, war that climate is warmer there. But now we're seeing them appear more and more in Northern California, and part of that is because it's warmer, our winters are not quite as cold, they can actually overwinter and be able to make it into next spring. Uh, and you know, we have some exotic pests that we're really concerned about keeping a close eye on. Spotted lanternfly is a perfect example of that. Uh, it first showed up in Pennsylvania, and from there it spread to 14 other states. And you know, some of the data that scientists are looking at, uh, California and our climate here, it's perfect for this pest, which uh, you know, is a big impact to the wine industry. It's one of its main hosts. Uh, and you know, scientists are still trying to figure out what other commodities is this pest going, going to be attracted to, and it can be quite damaging. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, my office working with the Department of Food and Agriculture, we have a pretty active uh, pest detection program to try to get ahead of some of these pests, but we do have concerns about just some of the trends that we have been seeing in the last decade of pests, uh, you know, being found more often in our state. I know we're talking about the 2022 uh, crop and livestock report, but I just got to ask, if we did have that severe storm happen earlier this year. Have you guys already started your outlook there on what that's going to look like um, for the rest of the year and for that crop report when it comes out sometime next year? Well, I can start well with strawberries. So obviously, um, off to a slower start than normal, about four to six weeks behind. Um, there were some other areas of the state that actually overproduced, so that was good news. Um, right now, we're still trending a little bit lower than last year, but I think overall, we're still expecting um, a very good crop uh, in strawberries. I think that uh, one of the benchmarks for our industry is Mother's Day, and to see where we're at in Mother's Day is kind of where we'll be for the rest of the year. Um, so for Mother's Day this year, over 95% of strawberries in grocery stores were from California. So that's a good sign for us. And then to only see that improve from there is good. So I think overall, uh, there, it, it will most likely be down. Um, obviously, about 5% of the total uh, acreage was lost for the year. Um, but there were places uh, in, in other parts of the state where over overproduction has occurred. So I think overall, uh, it's been good. Obviously difficult in the places that were flooded out, but, but a good year overall. Yes, and I thank you for saying that. And, <laughs> our industry feels so sorry for everyone that has had so much loss and it was awesome for the vines the storms <laughs> we lost two vineyards uh, but that's not much um, the the vines are so happy that they got that much rain because the rain rain washes salt from the soil so our vineyards are very happy we are three weeks late, which is consistent with a lot of other areas in the state, but that's actually because of cool summer weather. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be fine uh, because we don't go into frost like other regions do, so we'll just be a little late. I think on, on the veg side, and namely lettuce, um, it's a similar story, there were delays, um, and that wasn't just because you have an acre that was affected by flood, took on flood water, um, but just because of it was rainy um, coming out of the spring. You just had more kind of higher soil moisture. So it was harder conditions. You, you couldn't get in there and, and plant uh, according to your production schedule. And so it caused a delay. And so there was a few weeks on the front end, we would say kind of into April, uh, April throughout April and into May. But you know, as it relates right now, as we move through June and now kind of getting through July, we're, we're caught up, you know, supply is, uh, online in line with where it's normally been what what is um, interesting this year 2023 versus 2022 is the the disease pressure perspective kind of same for same and, and we believe it's because of what, what Juan was mentioning about overwintering 
we did have a cold winter. Uh, we also had a, a cold and a wet winter, which appeared to delay, if not uh, negatively affect, the ability of the thrips population to kind of overwinter, kind of you know set its next generation and the next generation to kind of revive as weather warmed. And so we were seeing earlier in this year fewer thrips, so less carriers of less disease, which meant there was kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, less disease uh, incidents in the fields that were being detected throughout the beginning of the year, which has continued to carry forward right now. So this same time versus last year, this same time, the disease pressure was a lot higher. And so, you know, that, that you know, uh, what unseasonably uh, cold and wet weather actually suppressed disease pressure as we've moved throughout the year thus far. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.